How gorgeous is this? Look at it. Absolutely beautiful. You know, I don't, I haven't gotten to, I love it so much. I, I don't have the UK version yet. Oh no. The mail has been very slow. So, oh, that, I guess that's pandemic. <laughs> um, so hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. I think so. Yes. Uh, yes. But I'm very excited to um, see it on people's, you know, bookstagrams and in other places. And someone actually today took a photo of it actually in a bookstore. So <gasps> that was very exciting because as you know, we were supposed to have been live together and in person doing this. Um, but sadly, life changed, but hopefully we'll be back. Things will be back. The weather is really bad where I am. So um, that might be why I'm cutting out slightly. But Samira, you, I think, are fine. So why don't you tell us what the book is about and the inspiration and we'll go from there. Okay, definitely. Well, um, I'll just say hi again, everyone. Um, I'm Samira Ahmed, the author of Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know. Uh, which is out today all over the UK. So I'm very, um, I'm very excited about it. Um, so Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know is the story of two young women told two centuries apart. And um, it, it follows the story of a young woman in present day. Um, her name is Kayam and she's a senior in high school in Chicago and she is in Paris for her annual summer vacation. Her father is French. Um, her mother is um, Indian and Muslim, and um, she is a budding art historian. And she um, really has she has this she had this idea that maybe she had found a connection between um, Alexander Dumas, the writer, Jean Delacroix, and then when she goes to Paris, she crosses paths with a young man named Alexander Dumas, who happens to be a descendant of the Alexander Dumas. Um, and together they find um, a reference to a kind of mysterious 19th century Muslim woman who pops up in letters between um, Dumas and Delacroix. So um, the second part of the story, there's a, there's a dual narrative, actually tells the story of that young woman that they find in those letters. But Kayam and Alexandre decide that they have to, um, they're just really compelled to, to find who this young woman in these letters is you know, who is she? Um, how is it that a Muslim woman in the 19th century was sort of in this artistic milieu, but we don't know any, but anything about her? And how, um, you know, and Kayama, she starts to learn a little bit more about sort of the history of this woman, or as she delves deeper into sort of art and literature, literary history in the 19th century in France and in Europe, she starts realizing how then, but even now, so often women's stories are buried and um, she wants to unearth this story. But tell us, um, so I understand that How... part of the inspiration for this story came from something that you did as a student. So talk to us a little bit about that. So um, when I was uh, um, in my last year in college at university, um, I did, I was an English major and I did my bachelor's thesis um, on the connection between Lord Byron and Napoleon, <laughs> and more, more specifically how Napoleon's conquest in Egypt or pseudo-conquest or attempt at conquest in Egypt actually inspired a lot of um, uh, tropes in, of Romantic Orientalism in, in British Romantic poetry, um, specifically in Byron. And the second character um, in Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know, Layla, is taken from and inspired by a Byron poem called The Jower. Um, which is a very fascinating and extremely long epic poem. And um, it's a story told about this young woman who is essentially um, sort of commodified. Um, she's literally fought over by two men, um, the Jawar and the Pasha, who are characters in my book. Um, and, you know, it's a duel to the death. And it's this very long, you know, epic, lush story. And yet we never hear... Layla's voice. It's actually, um, Byron wrote this um, poem in multiple points of view, which is actually pretty interesting for the time. Mm -hmm. um, but Layla's voice, the, the character who ostensibly the entire poem is, um, you know, predicated on is completely silenced. She never gets her own voice. Um, and so I, um, that little germ that little idea came from my bachelor's thesis and 
for this novel, I decided that I wanted to give her a voice. Um, so I wanted to reclaim that voice and that story from Byron. Um, and many people think that Byron, the story of this, uh, that Byron told in, in the Jower of Layla, this young woman who was fought over. And then in the Jower, it's a little, it ends up being a little different in my book, but in the Jower, she's actually drowned in a ter terrible sack death. Um, she's tied in a sack with stones and drowned. Um, and that story, some people say there is a possible real or historical connection to something that happened um, when Napoleon was in Egypt, where he had sort of taken up, and by taken up, I essentially mean like, you know, I guess kidnapped because the young woman was, you know, not an adult, had kind of, Napoleon had kind of created his own sort of quasi harem, shall we say, um, mm -hmm. on his conquest. And then he, when he left Egypt, he sort of ran away. Um, he left this young woman um, and she was considered some, you know, she was considered maybe somebody who had basically betrayed um, her family and her people and so was drowned in a sack death. Um, so it's interesting to see what, uh, I, I thought some of those threads kind of tied together and I thought it would be interesting to explore that and to give Layla a voice. I mean, it's fascinating because the entire time I was reading, I was like, surely, there wasn't a Muslim woman that was part of like these famous artists lives because it's something you you just never hear about and it is extraordinary to think that maybe you know there was this this whole thread of things that we didn't know that we don't know about that much right well I mean in this case I fictionalized it for the yeah. novel but that's yeah. why I wanted to reference that when Byron created that character he was aware of Napoleon's history in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so that little, that small story, that tiny thread of a story of that young woman who um, died in that terrible sack death um, is what some people say led Byron to his poem, The Jower. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just so, there's so many of those stories that we don't know and that we never really hear about. And uh, that's, part of why I wanted to, um, you know, write this book. And I think, you know, I think a lot of times when we, when we talk about, say, um, historical fiction, especially in movies, and people will say things like, well, how can there be like Indian characters in England at this time, or black characters, or, you know, especially, uh, at you know, with Americans, like British costume dramas are so wildly popular. Yeah. Um, and then there's always, you always hear someone saying something like, well, how could there be an Indian at that time? Or how could there be a black person? Well, I mean, just know your history a little bit, people. There actually were black people and Indians yeah. um, in England at the time. And they certainly would have crossed paths with, you know, white British people. Mm. We didn't spring up out of nowhere one day. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just, just so recently, mean, a few years ago. On that, there's, um, there's a passage in the book that really stayed with me where Hayam is kind of, um, considering who this mystery woman is in some letters that they find. And um, she says, there are literally centuries of women who never got to tell their stories. An invisible hand squeezes my ears for the nameless women history brushed aside. Um, and that seemed to me, obviously it's your character talking, but I guess mm -hmm. in part, is that you talking as well? Like I, I sense that like there's, there's something of you kind of in the feelings that she feels about these stories that have been ignored or hidden or forgotten? Well, I, I think when I was writing this, I was thinking, um, you know, I, I think it's always interesting when, you know, if you're on social media and somebody posts a photo of like, you know, women from like the 18th or 19th century and people are like, oh my gosh, look at what that woman was doing. And then I was thinking so much about the novel and the movie figures. Um, you know, the story of black women were so, so instrumental um, in the space program, so much like genius and brilliance and, you know, sort of our artistic invention uh, was lost because of you know, the tw twin, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of double-edged knife of patriarchy and racism. Mm. And so I just think of how those um, affected um, so many stories and it prevented us from hearing so many of those stories. Yeah. And I mean, I think we see it a little bit now in with movies, how we're trying to, uh, you know, the, some hidden stories are kind of being told. Um, but still, you know, we've just There's lost so much. To go. Because of yeah. The, yeah. There's a long way to go, isn't there? I think. Um, I want to yes. sort of 
talk about the present day storyline that we're in. So Hayam and Alexander in Paris on this sort of quest that they're going on. And mm -hmm. I love that there's like an art mystery at the center of this. <laughs> Was that always sort of going, going to be like the core of this book, this kind of quest like experience to find the answers that they need? I, when I was in college, this is another uh, thing going back to when I was younger, I actually worked in the university archive. Which is the public can't go to access the archives. You have to, pages will pull, you know, take the, the whatever the archival volumes or the archival boxes and send them up to you. Um, you have to request them. And so it was just, you know, two, two sub basement levels full of just boxes of old letters and, you know, rare volumes and um, all of these things. And I, I was so fascinated that th at that time, and even now, how you write, read stories about how someone, you know, had a garage sale and they found a Picasso or something like that. <laughs> um, and some of those stories are, um, you know, actually true where you find these, you know, like something that's been hidden or lost, but sort of in plain sight. And so that's why I wanted to uh, kind of kind of go into that because Kayam remarks about it too, like, well, this is actually all here. It's not really that hard to dig up. It's not like, you know, we're looking for the lost city of Atlantis or something like that. Mm. Um, a lot of this is hiding in plain sight. And even with Alexander Dumas, he had a novel that was published posthumously just uh, less than a de about a decade or so ago. And that came out because a researcher was in like the, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris and happened to come across a serialized novel that of Dumas that I guess no one was like had put together and had kind of been basically been forgotten over time and then he uh, there was no ending yet so he added the ending and it was published it became a bestseller in France um, so anyway it's interesting yes the, I, I love that idea of literary mystery and I think one of my inspirations for this book was Possession by A.S. Byatt. Okay. Um, which I love that book so much. Um, she's such a brilliant writer. Um, and she had these Victorian, these academics searching for this, these Victorian poets or a connection between these Victorian poets, which I always think there's just so much of history we don't know. Yeah. So it's fun to speculate. See, saying possession by A.S. White is so much more highbrow because I was like, oh, it gave me in part a kind of national treasure type vibe or like the library. Yeah, I, yeah. Sort of like, <laughs> <laughs> the librarian, yes, okay, it definitely has the librarians. Possession is highbrow and very brilliant, but it does have. I mean, I told someone that it's a little bit like, it's sort of like librarians or national treasure meets and because it's in Paris, uh, you know, meets like the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> um, so I think that it does have a little bit, and you know, national treasure is fun. I love that. I love that film series. So. Oh, sorry, let's try again. Yes, okay. hi. I think we were just talking about um, lost stories. So a lost yes. connection feels like it kind of fits with the theme. Yes. I mean, <laughs> this is one of those pandemic things, I'm afraid. We I know. Well, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I, I mean, I think we all are used to used to things like this happening by now. But I think we were just talking a little bit. I think I was telling a little bit about my experience in the university archives. and Yes. Uh, yeah. We're talking a little bit about the national treasure vibes <laughs> from the book, yeah. which, um, well, yes, I love that you think that. <laughs> I just thought that I love, I basically love like an art heist type narrative, whatever, whatever it's in. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the sort of the dual timelines that you've got going on. So we spoke mm -hmm. about um, Layla, who's kind of a few hundred years in the past, and Kayam, who's in present day Paris. Um, mm -hmm. What did you want to do by having those storylines kind of run in parallel and show about the similarities and the differences between the experiences of Muslim women, right. no matter where in time they are? Right. Well, I mean, I think you kind of hit it. Uh, um, I wanted to show, two. Th I guess, a few things. One is, um, as you read, you start to see some of the connections between Layla and Kayam. And, you know, we see how Kayam... Uh, feels kind of like it was a little bit like her destiny to find Layla. Like she mm -hmm. feels like a kind of guardianship over um, Layla's story. And I, that piece for me was important because I think, you know, a lot of times we can think of history as just sort of dusty old facts, um, but those were all people and people's lives. Um, and, you know, there were people just like us, which I wanted to show with, you know, with the Kayam story, which is, 
you know, Layla, who was, you know, two centuries earlier, still had her own thoughts and feelings and hopes and dreams and, you know, loves and desires. And, um, you know, she had ambitions for herself. But I think for her, you know, some of her ambitions and things were obviously thwarted, uh, not just, you know, because of the time she was living in, because of, uh, you know, colonialism, because of patriarchy. So, so many of those. And I think um, Kayam, and this is a little bit explained just a tiny bit because of a window that her mother kind of opens for her to see like, you know, these stories were lost and for these reasons, but some of those reasons are still very much part of our society today. Um, you know, like, I, like she mentions, like issues of patriarchy, of colonialism, of, of, you know, bigotry and racism, of Islamophobia. So I think we can see, um, you know, like you said earlier, we have a long way to go. We have gone a long way, but not far enough. So no, I, I think those two stories connect in those ways. Yeah, it's really interesting because we spend time with Layla in her sections, and then also we spend time with her in Kayam's sections right. as well. Kind of and two different time periods, yes. Yeah, in the little unravelings and the little things that she is finding out and trying to piece together. But you do, you do sort of tell Layla's story, but you also do leave sort of some things a mystery and I wondered about that and kind of I love that in the end she I don't want to spoil anything but it's you know it's in the past she is telling this story on her own terms both mm -hmm. both the women in the novel are and so there are things they are choosing mm -hmm. to keep back was that a very conscious thing of like mm -hmm. telling your story I guess isn't always about telling everything right I mean I think that um when you know I um, Karl of Knausgaard, I can never say his last name right, Knausgaard, um, he yeah. talked about how memoir is a novel. Like, he huh. references memoir as a novel, because he's, and he's, you know, he's, he's written a lot of pages of memoir. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I thought it was interesting listening to an interview with him where he said that, because, you know, he talks about how, you know, what we decide to tell or share might be as important as what we don't share or what we don't tell. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I think we can even think about it related to social media. Like we curate ourselves, our lives on social media. And there's some things that we show and some things that we don't show. It doesn't mean that it's totally inauthentic, but it's not necessarily the whole picture. Um, and, you know, the facts or the pieces of ourselves that we want to keep separate can be for a lot of reasons. Maybe it's because we don't want to reveal something about either ourselves that can be in a negative light or someone else. Maybe it's that we feel like there's some parts of ourselves that we want to hold just for ourselves and not mm -hmm. to share publicly. And I think for both Kayam and Layla, one of the things that they grapple with in their stories are who owns the story? Like who owns my story? Or who, own if I uncover a story, does that mean it's mine to tell? Um, and so I wanted to sort of think of those questions. And I think that question of like, is someone else's story mine to tell is something that fiction writers grapple with a lot. But I think we even see it often in things like um, true crime, which is, you know, really popular. Um, mm. If you're listening to true crime podcasts or other things, um, especially when it comes to the story of the victims, um, yeah. how much of their story is really ours to tell? How much of it do we own? How much of it is part of history um, and should, um, be known. So, you know, I think it brings up a lot of interesting questions and the, both of the young women in the story kind of grapple with them in their own time periods. Mm. I, I think from what I've read of your work, um, you're often talking about the power of stories in different ways. So like Love, Hate and Other Filters kind of looks at what we assume when we hear a certain type of narrative and um, internment looked at kind of how individual stories might be lost when sort of people in power lump people into groups rather than looking at them as individuals and and you've talked about kind of the idea of forgotten stories here mm -hmm. how um how conscious are you that that you want to tell stories about stories which seems a little bit meta but like you know. <laughs> um it is a little bit meta i think it's kind of ever present in my mind as i'm writing because uh you know when you're a novelist and you're writing a story um, I, I kind of keep a separation between myself as the writer and the narrator in the, the novels. I mean, I don't, these books are all written in first person, so I've created the characters for those. But I think sometimes people also want um, the author 
and the writer to essentially be the same person. And I sort of ascribe mm -hmm. to this idea of implied author, which is that the author is also a kind of creation. And um, so I am the writer and the implied author is a sort of this go between between me and the reader. And it's created that implied author is created from you know, reader assumption, but also like what the, what the writer I have put out and is available for people to see, especially, it's especially interesting to think about that now in terms of social media, because authors are definitely a lot more just out there. Um, so people can see pieces of our lives. And that goes back to the thing that you were saying earlier, which is what parts of ourselves do we tell in a story? What parts of ourselves do we not? What parts of ourselves do we hide? So I think that that all um, that notion of story, even as I'm writing the story, is always really, you know, kind of prevalent in my mind. Maybe it's just like in, I might not be consciously thinking about it, but I think it's sort of like just kind of there in the ether of my, the creative brain or whatever. Because I'm writing a story, but the stories exist outside of me too, like once they're in the text, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, lo I love that idea of kind of the implied author and and one thing I wanted to ask about so right at the beginning of this book um we have like a very a sort of almost like one page kind of chapter from Hayan where she's talking about her dual identity so French American mm -hmm. and, you know she's Indian and American she's Muslim and American mm -hmm. and um, I wondered how much of that experience was informed by your own experience of being mm -hmm. Muslim American and being sort of Indian and American dual. yes fuel in some ways. Well, I think there's, um, you know, W.B. Du Bois called it like your double consciousness in a way. And I think that always uh, exists. Like, you know, in America, there's like the notion of the hyphen, like where, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm Indian and American. In my mind, being Indian and American and Muslim American, those, those ideas are not at odds with themselves. They are all parts of a whole. Um, but I think, you know, politically and sociopolitically, maybe one of the things that we see and definitely historically is that for too, too often the ter those terms like American or maybe British, uh, I, I can't speak to that personally, but yeah. are, you know, ascribed or owned only by a certain group. And I just very much, uh, disagree with that. So um, the, the notion of Americanness encompasses my Indianness and my Muslimness and all of those pieces. And yet still, you know, when you're navigating society here in the States, you have, you're kind of always ever made aware of those things because a lot of, because of, you know, institutionalized um, racism or Islamophobia or, or that kind of thing. Um, and I think the definition of the citizen you know, the, def the definition of what it means to be American is and should always be malleable. And some people want to keep that fixed. And so yeah. I think that's where we see conflicts arise. Um, so I, but I also think that's an interesting part to explore. Like where have I, you know, what are those sort of intersections and what does it mean for me as a writer, but also for my characters as they're trying to live their lives? You know, because for young people, like, yes, she's, you know, Kayam is Indian American and Muslim American, and she's biracial. And, um, you know, she speaks English, um, but also French, and her mom speaks Urdu. And, um, you know, but she's also like a kid who's just trying to live her life. Like, she has her own ambitions, and she wants to go to you know, college and become an art historian and she has a crush on somebody. And so for young people, I think it's just so much pressure that is put on them, especially for young people of color, um, you know, the quote unquote, those who are othered. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's an interesting place to explore, but uh, you know, I think it's an unfair burden to put on people. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, let's, um, let's, sort of move on to something a little bit lighter because you mentioned the word crush there and um <laughs> and while while this book deals with um politics and i use that in the, in the sense of you know it talks about feminism it talks about patriarchy mm -hmm. it talks about um history and erasure and colonialism um, mm -hmm. there is also this sort of romantic through line which starts with a very sweet meet cute yeah um, <laughs> how do you go about creating a romance that feels um, very real and that, that doesn't overtake the book because this isn't a book mm -hmm. I would describe I mean and I don't and I don't know if I'm if I'm wrong in this but I wouldn't describe it first to somebody as a romance but that right. is a key part you know it's a key part of 
of kind of Kion finding finding herself and finding this story and kind of finding mm-hmm. her connection to Layla. Right. So I think of it as a love story. Because I think when yeah. you use the term romance, you know, romance has specific, romance novels have specific tropes, which I don't really hit on in, in this. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the love story um, does play an important role. And in some ways, it takes away from sort of, I guess, what you're the, what we would call the maybe the main narrative, but it, in other parts, it's completely embroiled into it. And, you know, as a young woman, um, you know, she's just 17 years old and it's sort of just like that first blush of love and maybe falling in love and ex- experiencing that. And I love writing about those early sort of heady days of kind of having a crush on someone because it just, it, it's a very visceral thing. Um, yeah. And so I just, I, I just love exploring that. Like, I think, you know, people remember their first crush or, you know, your first kiss. There's a reason why those um, are just so prevalent in books and, you know, novels and TV. And it has, you know, an imprint on us. And so I just love, um, I love exploring that space. I just think that that space of young adulthood and first crushes and also like early ambitions are are just naturally dramatic, you know, the, um, you know, butting heads with parents and, and all of that stuff. Um, and it, it does have, you know, for young people, emotions can be, you know, very liminal. And I think that's just a cool space to explore. And it's also really fun to write. Um, yeah. You know, in this, the meet cute, like, this isn't going to be a spoiler because it happens really early is like, you know, Kayam meets Alexandre, um, uh, Kayam meets Alexandre when she's literally scraping like dog crap off of her shoe because she's what if anyone's been to Paris you know that can happen um, <laughs> yeah we might step although it is true like all my French friends are like what if you're actually if you're actually French or Parisian you're not going to step in it because you have like this you know I guess dog radar. poop radar <laughs> yeah. yes um, and so she's scraping it off her shoe which is not like you know it's not necessarily the most romantic way to meet somebody but it definitely is memorable yeah <laughs> I definitely think it, it in like I love I love the excitement of it like what you're talking about those the, the excitement of those few early days and combined with the excitement of this this kind of quest this mm-hmm. search for this mysterious woman who they you know they later find out um is is Layla like I think there's just something just very uplifting about it in quite a lot of ways as well and it is just just really exciting mm-hmm. how do you um how do you create like a romantic interest that you kind of want to write about and that you want readers to root for as well? Mm -hmm. So I think what's it, just one quick other thing I wanted to add is what you're talking about right there is the the common theme between both of those is discovery. Mm. Like the discovery, what the discoveries of young love and the discovery of this kind of history mystery. And both like, you know, when you discover something for the first time, it is amazing. Like think of how even like with little babies, like when they just discover like their hands, right? Yeah. And people, and now that we're like on social media, there's like constantly tons of videos of like babies just discovering like, whoa, oh my God. It's just like such, there's just a kind of innocence about it, but just like joy and optimism too. Um, and so I think when I'm trying to, when I try to craft the characters or the love story, the love interest, I want to make sure that obviously they're a well-rounded person. Um, you know, I want the, them like Alexandre um, to have a full you know life like he yeah. I don't want him to just be like the drop in like I exist only for uh, for Kayam you know mm-hmm. I don't want them to be just like these two dimensional characters because ideally in a novel all the characters should be well rounded so I I for all the characters I sort of create their some backstory elements that never make it into the book. Okay. So, I mean, just like small things, like, for example, I might have, uh, for some of the characters, I create kind of their courses that they are taking. Um, Like what electives they've chosen, um, what their favorite places to eat are, like what their favorite foods are. Um, So I don't generally share that because that's sort of just like my sort of brainstorming and Mm -hmm. trying to know and learn about this character. Um, And I feel like kind of, having those things in mind helps me realize like someone's asking me, why would you do that? So having some of those things in mind helps me um, when I'm writing it, think like, well, is this something that Alexandra do? Is this something that Kayam would do? Is it out of character for them within the context of the book of, and how I've written it? And also in the bigger context of how I've created 
that character. And so I think whether they're a love interest or, you know, another secondary character, um, I want to have them be a fulfilled character. And for Alexandre, he has his own motivations, which we find, um, um, which we find in, in the novel. And he has, you know, he has a life before he meets Kayam. So he should, he would, he would respond to her and to the situations they're in based on that life and his experiences. And mm -hmm. like, you know, he is like a, you know, a swoony young man, a little, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a handsome Parisian that she happens to meet while scraping um, dog crab off of her shoe. Um, so I think, um, you know, I, I think it's always, like I said earlier, we always remember sort of those early and first crushes. So it's an easy thing to kind of tap into. Yeah. And then um, it's just, just so fun. It's just really, honestly, it's fun to write, you know? <laughs> I love the idea that you have like, almost like I imagine TV shows have like a, a Bible for your book that has all this kind of backstory in it that we are never going to see. I mean, it's I, not, that, I it's not necessarily that organized, but I have like <laughs> notebooks where I'll write down like here, like she took this. And like, I remember for Love, Hate and Other Filters, which you mentioned earlier, um, for my character in there, I do have her full, like she goes to an American high school, I have her full bell schedule. I have like what time she has lunch. Wow. Um, and you know, I, I had to make certain choices for her, like why she took French class instead of Spanish. So okay. those are just things I know in my mind, but they come into, you know, they eventually come into the, the novel, so. Oh my gosh, I love it. I want, and I now want annotated versions of all your books <laughs> with like, you know, I know that would be a yeah. fun idea. I've, yeah. I've done a few annotated um, giveaways. I might have to do some of those again because it's it's fun. And plus there's little things because I worked in the archives. Some of those kind of made it in, you know, just like little of my own experiences made it in, into the book since I, it's, it stems from my own kind of youth. So tell me about working in the archives because I love that idea. I mean, when I was younger, I had dreams of being a librarian slash like... <laughs> archivist discovering like old scrolls and things like that but talk, about, talk us through kind of s some of the things you might have, have found or kind of how you worked and like what <laughs> that you sort of retain to then put to then put into this novel whether it's on the page or whether mm -hmm. it informs the novel well I don't want to I mean a lot of it is just grunt work so I'm not going to romanticize how every I wasn't making like incredible discoveries as like the yeah. you know um, a young person all the time, but, um, you know, so I was, I did two jobs in the archives. I was a page, so I would get books for, you know, researchers or academics who were coming in, and that's how I sort of got to know the collections, because um, I would be going everywhere and, um, you know, searching for these old books and old archival volumes, uh, you know, letters that no one had read, like, you know, because academics might be searching very, researching, like, extremely obscure things. <laughs> Um, and, you know, then I would sit down and take a look at them. And then um, I also, we also had this amazing thing called the book vault. The vault was like where you have like the most rare and incredible thing. So okay. in there, we, we also had things like a Nobel Prize. So I actually got to hold a Nobel Prize in my hands because the, the winner of that Nobel Prize had kind of given it to the university wow. for safekeeping. I held, this is, it sounds, it's a little macabre, but it's an interesting fact. So I'll tell you this. I, we also had... Um, a very tiny piece of fabric from the pillow upon which Abraham Lincoln died. Oh my that, goodness. Yes, that had his blood stain on it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, people don't realize all the things that are in university archives. Yeah. Um, and then I, um, when the University of Chicago was having its 100th anniversary, um, the chief archivist had given me a task, like a little mission, because we were creating kind of an exhibit for the university's, you know, centennial. And he said, I want you to find the staff notes, the faculty meeting notes for the very first faculty meeting at the university. And I was like, okay, great. Uh, you know, I'll just look it up. On, there's, not, there's no archival box that says university faculty minutes or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. And he was like, here's the people who are in attendance. And we think it was this professor um, who was taking the minutes, the notes. And we, we want to find the president of the university, like the lore was that he had said something mm -hmm. about how we have to be, you know, one in spirit or something like that. And he's like, so can we, let's just find the original document for that. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So then, um, cause he said, well, it's kind of been lost. We don't know exactly where it is. 
So then I just basically use cross-referencing skills, which my cross-referencing okay. skills are great because I worked <laughs> in a library. <laughs> Um, and I eventually found it in like this folder. Um, it was like misfiled. It was like under the wrong year or whatever. And I found her handwritten note. It was just there. And then it appeared in that. Um, so it wasn't as exciting as finding, say, a missing 19th century Muslim woman. But you can see that things get lost in archives because people, yeah. the file system was, is people. Mm. And people make mistakes. Or like one archivist might say like, oh, this should be filed under this subject heading. And then a hundred years ago, and then now no archive, you know, maybe somebody's like, why would anybody file it under that? So it's, I don't know. It's yes. Working in archives was really pretty fun. And I also worked in the book lab of the archives, the restoration lab. So I got oh, to help restore old um, books. Um, I think, I mean, you might not have been discovering long lost people, but I think it sounds really exciting. And, and kind of, as you were talking, I was wondering if there's um, a similarity at all in kind of, going on a trail like that to find a piece of information and kind of piecing together a novel as well from everything mm. in your mind and kind of following the trail of kind of your character <laughs> and the trail of your well, the, There's definitely a lot of confusion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then there's a lot of like, what the heck do I do? Where do I go next? Why doesn't someone just tell me the answer? Um, so it is, it is interesting to think about that as, I, I guess I think of it as puzzle pieces that have to be put together. Mm. Um, which is, I don't know why you think of it that way, because I'm actually terrible at puzzles. So, okay. um, um, but I sort of feel like, you know, in my mind, when I'm creating this world or the story, there's a lot of these different little pieces. Um, mm. and I have to sort of put it together in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, in a way that when you look at it, people will say like, oh, I can see what this picture is. Mm. Um, so I guess it's similar to like some of that archival search, which is, you might have little pieces like I did for finding this, these notes. Like I had little pieces, like who were the initial people at that faculty meeting? Likely. Um, I knew the year, but it could be like, you know, that year had probably a hundred different archival boxes. So in each one of those is a folder. So I guess it's just sort of pulling on the threads and hoping that you can make sense of it. And then, you know, sometimes you fail and you're like, okay, well, I got to start over. There's a lot of starting over and writing a novel <laughs> or re restarting elements that didn't work. So, oh wow. And um, I want to just say if anyone's got any questions, do pop them in the comments box and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to ask a bit more about the research process for this specific novel. So, did you get to go to Paris um, once, yes. twice? So, I go to Paris. I actually have family who live in Paris, so I go every year. Um, I know it's, it's such, it's terrible to have to visit family, but it's, uh, I, I really suffered through it. Um, so for this, of course, I had to do, you know, the most arduous of research on pastries because I do include some pastries in the novel and every pastry shop I mentioned in the novel is an actual place. Amazing. That's you one of my favorites. Right? You tried I, the I, I, I try, of Somebody course. has to do it. Somebody has Someone to do, has to do it. I'm very, I suffer for my art. This is like what, <laughs> so I, I did over the two years kind of, um, I actually started writing this novel in Paris, like on, um, on Rue Montregoy, um, a street that I mentioned in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I somehow like at that time, you know, the ideas were sort of coming together and then I just was there and I went to this cafe and started writing. And I also happened to just click a picture at that time, like, Hey, I think I'm starting a new idea. So I have the moment captured. Um, and that is a street, um, that's referenced in the book. So I definitely try to, um, hit on as many parts of Paris that I love, but also I tried to go to, um, places that people wouldn't necessarily see. I mean, so... Um, you know, the kids don't go to the Louvre or the Musée d'Orsay. They, um, you know, they go to the Petit Palais Museum, which is a free museum, by the way, when you go to Paris and has some lovely art and is very rarely full and has one of my favorite cafes in Paris. Um, it's like a second floor outdoor cafe with these beautiful mosaics. And behind there is that little garden where she and Alexandre go and almost have a kiss and then get interrupted, interrupted by very nosy American tourists. Um, <laughs> and it's a little pocket park. And um, I first found it on Google Earth, because I was just sort of like looking in that area. And I was like, what is this? I, I've been to this 
literal corner so many times. Mm -hmm. And then I found it. And then I was like sending emails to my friends in Paris. I'm like, have you, do you know where this place is? Have you been there? And no one that I knew in France had it. It's really just this tiny pocket of a park. And then the next time I went, I went there. So um, that made it into the book. And, um, you know, the American Library um, in Paris made it into the book. And so anyway, it's, um, uh, it was fun to incorporate those, you know, some of my, my Parisian travels into the novel. That's like the best research. <laughs> I was going to say, do you think it would have been a very different novel if you would, do you think you would have started writing this novel in America kind of at home or, or was it that you were in Paris and, and that kind of fueled you? Do you think it would have been a different book otherwise? <laughs> well, I think that, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't know how, if I can find, if I know the real answer to that question. I think yeah. that I, um, I definitely think that being able to go to Paris and being lucky enough to be able to be there and sit there, you know, every, it has a kind of natural inspirational element to it, mm. I guess. Like every city, I mean, I'm a city person, so I love cities. I love the energy of cities. Um, yeah. So I think that, um, you know, every city just has its own vibe. And I think just even being there and like, you know, you can hear the music of the language because people all around you are speaking it. I'm sure it definitely found its way into the book. Mm. How is your French? My French is generally pretty bad. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I thought you were gonna, the way you were saying it, I was like, oh, she's gonna say it generally, her French is pretty good. And I was like- I, I mean, was, I don't know, I think it's okay. I can carry on a conversation, but um, you know, I don't know. I, I wouldn't like say, you know, it's nothing to write home about. I mean, I didn't really learn French till I was an adult. I didn't take it in high school. Yeah. I took Latin for some reason. That didn't turn out to be very handy at all. <laughs> I, I took Latin as well. I like to say that it gives me a better understanding of the English language because yeah. of, you know, the origins of words. But I mean, not really. Knows? I did learn more grammar because of Latin. Because I don't know, in American schools, we just don't learn grammar, which is probably why. I mean, I always think like when... Um, like my British editors get my books. They must be like, well, this girl doesn't know how to use commas at all. Do they, do they not teach her anything? But you know, our rules are a little different. That's fine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I have a very important question for you, which is, um, obviously we heard you, you did lots of taste tests in Paris. Yes. What is your favorite pastry and what is the one place you recommend we go to when we can all travel safely again? It's so hard to say just one. Okay, so I say for the for the macarons, Lauderay is my favorite. Of course. Right. Um, so it's a classic, but Lauderay, there's a lot Lauderay in London. Yep. Right? I mean, isn't there's there one? I mean, there's isn't one, there one in Harrods? Station, and there no? might be one in Harrods as well. Yeah. There um, are so that's easy. That's one that you can get to, actually. Yeah. Um, so there is um, a, a pastry that I had of the small um, bakery in, in the Marais. Um, and I mentioned it in this book, and now I want to say it's either called, it's like Pain d'Or or something like that. Gosh, I can't remember the name of it now. Anyway, it's in the book. Well, um, and don't they, worry, everyone can read the book. Tomorrow. They have <laughs> this incredible, like, um, saffron creme ghetto that I had, which was, like, out of this world, so amazing. But it was, like, a special, so it was, like, just a seasonal special. So, um, Yes, That's it was absolutely, it's, it, oh my God, it's so fantastic. But I, I also just love like a classic, um, I love a religieuse, which is basically like two shoes um, filled with cream, like a rose cream or chocolate. I'm very partial to the rose flavors. That's the one that looks like nuns, right? Like It's called a nun, cute. yes. So there's like yes. a fat shoe at the bottom and then yeah. like a skinnier shoe at the top and then there's a dollop of the cream. Yes. And it's a, you know, in some ways it's like a simple pastry, but it's like, it is delicious. The only um, reason I know is because of Great British Bake Off. One time they had to make oh, yeah. the oh, like challenge. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I cannot, yeah, I can't bake. I, I, so when I'm in Paris, I have this rule, which is I can eat as many pastries per day as I want to. What a great rule. What a great yeah. rule. Um, uh, someone asked earlier, actually, about structuring your novel and how mm -hmm. you kind of work on your novels. So mm -hmm. with this one, were you, did you write all of the present day stuff in one go and then all of Layla's stuff mm -hmm. separately? Were you kind of dotting around? How do you, how do you go about structuring something like this? So what I, when I first get the idea for a novel, the first thing I always do is write a short story. Um, so <laughs> I take a character, usually it's a main character um, that I thought of, 
and I put them in a short story. And now sometimes that short story makes its way into the book. Sometimes it doesn't. But that gives me a sense of, do I love this character? Do I, am I interested in expanding this world from a short story to, you know, 80,000 words or, you know, mm -hmm. however many words it's going to be? Does the yeah. story have legs? Um, and so in this case, for Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to, to Know, I actually wrote um, Layla's entire narrative first. That's yeah. the, the character in the past. Um, because her narrative is really an answer to Byron's poem, The Jower. Um, and so it was, you know, really a response to that. So I wrote that whole thing first. Mm. And then I wrote Kayam's Present Day. Now, the thing with that is it's two different voices in, you know, and the time span is basically 1811, roughly, to, yeah. you know, 2020. So it's a very long time span. And as you noted, there's both Layla's story in her point of view element, but there's also pieces of Layla um, within um, Kayam's story. So the one that is like in 1811 and then what happens in Kayam's story, which is like, like Layla, like 20 or 30 years later mm -hmm. after that. Um, and so I then had to just plot out, like literally just took a giant piece of paper <laughs> and had to draw the timelines on it. Because I was like, wait a minute, what have I done here? I'm like, because if you change something in one timeline, it changes the other, it affects the other. But also, you know, you have to have some story continuity. So then I literally just, and I'm, let's see, I'm, I'm not a visual person. I don't know why. So it was difficult. So I had to literally draw out a whole timeline and write down all the major events that occurred on the timeline okay. for both characters. So because sometimes when one thing would happen in one chapter, you know, the chapters of the characters also kind of speak to each other. Mm. So I had to just kind of work that out. So yeah, I was, I was like, why did I choose to do this dual point of view? Sometimes, sometimes you're really like, okay, am I kicking myself for what I chose I mean, to do with this? From a reader's point of view, it really works and it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And um, I'm also intrigued. So obviously you read the Byron poem and I'm assuming um, there was a lot of things that you read during um, your BA in romantic mm -hmm. orientalism. Was there anything new? Well, not new. Was there anything old that you hadn't read before that you read specifically for this book? Had you read, say, all of Dumas' work beforehand or? No, I'm not that. <laughs> all of Dumas' work would be like so much. No, I did not do that. But actually one thing I did want to mention, which is that if I go back um, even further to what was the inspiration for my bachelor's thesis, it actually was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Okay. And so one of the things that I did do for this book was like revisit some of those old things that I had read, especially like with the romantics. So I reread a lot of the romantics um, because those orientalist tropes appear in so much romantic um, poetry. But mm. in, in Frankenstein, there's this character of Safi um, who appears in the novel. When I first read it, I was like, what? This is, she's Muslim. Like her dad, um, I think was Turkish, um, but her mom was a white Christian. Um, in the novel. And so she is this character that um, takes on, she becomes a character that has to be saved from her savage, you know, Muslim father. Mm. And which I thought was really interesting. And of course, she's portrayed in the novel as being, you know, fair skinned and etc. Um, and it was interesting because when I, when I first read Frankenstein, that immediately popped out for me. And it's not really something that you really hear about when you read Frankenstein. Um, because, you know, Mary Shelley, you know, was this feminist. Her mother was a feminist and a, a writer, but her mother was also um, very Islamophobic <laughs> and, a, and an Orientalist. And so it's interesting to consider how that came to pass. And you can see it in, in Mary Shelley's work, too. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was interesting because um, when I read that, I then read, like after I read Frankenstein, I read different works that might have influenced Mary Shelley. So her father's um, writing, um, her mother's writing, and then the poets like at, uh, surrounding her at the time. So I always call Mary Shelley a problematic fave. I mean, I think that she, is, obviously Frankenstein is brilliant. You know, she wrote yeah. it as a young, a young woman, the same yep. age as like the characters in my book. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there is, the, there are these Orientalist tropes that appear in the story. Mm. Well, one thing I mean, I absolutely love about your novel is the kind of, um, the sort of, subtle pushback against all of that and I love that you have these two women who don't really need to be rescued they kind of do their own rescuing from mm -hmm. various different things and I won't spoil it but um at the start and I kind of want to sort of end with this question I get at the start um Hayam is quite 
uh, upset, angry. I don't know quite how to describe it because she has been, she's written an essay for the school of her right. children and she has been rejected. And I read that and I was like, but what an amazing girl at 17 to kind of put yourself out there like that mm -hmm. and kind of really just go after what you want. And um, so I wanted to end by asking if, what it is that you want readers to get out of this novel, perhaps girls, young girls in particular, mm -hmm. I mean, all, all readers, are you kind of looking to inspire? Are you looking to inform? What are you looking to sort of leave them thinking about when they, when they finish? Well, both Layla and Kayam are ambitious young women. Yeah. And I think we've seen through all of history, even now you can see it, you can literally see it right now in the US presidential election about how ambition is considered something that is so positive and wonderful to have if you're a man. Yeah. But somehow like being a woman with ambition is terrible. And um, I just could not disagree more. <laughs> so <laughs> I think young women have ambitions and they should have them and they should, um, you know, we should, they should be uplifted and lauded for them and helped along the way with their ambitions from those, you know, their elders who might be able to, to help them forge their paths. But I think young women are able to forge their own paths in a lot of ways. But I so find it disheartening when we still, even now, mm. see um, society using the term ambition when women are ambitious as if it's a negative, um, as if our ambitions should be diminished because of who we are or something like that. Um, you know, it's just so much, this goes back to that patriarchy thing. It's just such a, it's just so deeply unfair. And that's why I really wanted Kayam to have an ambition and, you know, encouraged by both of her parents yep. um, to do that. And, um, and Layla has her ambitions too. And she's in a much tougher spot um, than Kayam because she is an orphan and she doesn't have you know, someone lifting her up. I mean, she sort of has a magical helper in some ways, but she has to find the strength in herself. And Kayam finds the strength in herself too. It's just in a, you know, in, in, in different ways and in different times. So um, I just, I just believe in ambitious girls and I hope they can believe in themselves too. That is an absolutely lovely note to end on. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you everyone for watching as well. Thanks everyone. Out today. Um, happy launch day and I hope you have something lovely planned for the rest Thanks. of the Thanks, I'm going to have to make a cake for sure. <laughs> I mean, why not? Yeah, a cake and like a luxurious hot chocolate with loads of whipped cream. We'll that sounds it. excellent. I will, take, I will take you up on that. So cheers. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.